welcome to Bharata first if you're watching big picture with me Frank Rouse and Pereira since you're here please like the video subscribe hit the bell icon and share the video as well so that more people get to know about us you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some insights of content if you like our content please contribute to keep it alive a small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content let me also inform you that we have some massive discounts at the Bharata first knowledge center and we will be closing registrations for the existing packages soon. This is your last chance to get these offerings. I will be taking live big picture current affairs analysis classes very soon. So don't miss out on that. Go to kc.bharatapas.com for more details and register now for all your competitive exams needs. Hundreds are reaping the benefits of the Knowledge Center. Don't be left behind. All this information along with some musty recommendations are in the description of the video. Please go through it. And now onto the discussion. As the global recovery gains strength, the price of crude oil is nearing its highest level since 2018, while the price of natural gas and coal are hitting record highs amid an intensifying energy shortage. The price of Brent crude has uh, breached the $85 per barrel mark, reaching its highest level since 2018 on the back of a sharp increase in global demand as the world economy recovers from the pandemic. Key oil producing countries have kept crude oil supplies on a gradually increasing production schedule, despite a sharp increase in global crude oil prices. The price of Brent crude has nearly doubled compared to the price of $42.5 per barrel a year ago. High crude oil prices have contributed to the prices of petrol and diesel regularly setting new record highs across the country in 2021. In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze the rise in global fuel prices and impact on India. Joining me on the program today are Ajay Dua, former Commerce and Industry Secretary, Government of India, Jen Das Gupta, former Ambassador of India at the WTO, and TK Arun of the Economic Times. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Big Picture. Um, so, Dua, let me start the program with you first. You know, let's uh, analyze this global fuel price rise and uh, you know let's not forget that we've seen an upward trajectory as far as uh, economy is concerned and uh, growth and consumption too has uh, has come back almost to pre covid times right now and we've seen fuel prices also going up considerably around the globe but as far as production is concerned the opec countries are taking a calculated uh, uh, you know gamble or move as far as increasing the production of oil and hence the prices are going up. How would you look at the entire fuel price situation uh, as far as uh, the global market is concerned? Frank, while well, you are absolutely right that the, there is a recovery going around the world, particularly in all the so-called G20 nations and the ones who drive the global GDP, let's not magnify it to that it is unprecedented levels of economic development or the escalation and uh, recovery which has taken place. It is the so-called base effect is being wiped off. The low, you know, everybody suffered some more than others, India more than others, for instance, during the uh, year 2021 and 21, 22, you've seen some, some recovery there. The fact is, the, it is the production which is not at the same level as the as it should have been. There used to be a secular rise in production every year, be it of hydrocarbons or be it of so-called black black you know black coal, lignite, brown coal, etc., which wasn't which hasn't taken place globally in the last uh, eighteen to twenty months. The reason being that no one was sure how, when would one come, the world come out of COVID or when, I, no one can even say it even now, I agree, but that there would be a lull between the waves and things would, the, the, the pandemic waves, and that there will be a window of the kind which we are seeing now, which is a much longer window. And We've seen restrictions of movement of goods and human beings being lifted most parts. And then we are seeing a bit of economic recovery taking place. That was number one. Second, 
because no one was sure when would you when would the production be back to the normal or start seeing this a secular increase no one really stacked enough raw materials including the feed stocks of coal and for the few feed stocks or the fuel which was which was needed for driving taking the process forward so in india the coal for instance just to give an example and let me allow you to move on that it is not the real increase in consumption of coal it is the low inventories which were kept at the power stations because the no one wanted to lock up its money their own money in that as such the utilities don't get money from their distributors so they didn't want to lock it up there so coal india and singareni coal mines uh, did not produce enough coal if you look at their data there's a reduction in their the volumes of coal which they produced with, from compared to 1920 so on the whole even with uh, the opec the yes they did not increase the production i can i can see but the reduction on their side is linked to how the what the market demanded absolutely absolutely mr dasgupta let me bring you into the picture now you know let's talk about the global fuel prices and what kind of an impact it is having on india and do you see this at some level having some kind of an impact on the relationship between the producer and the consumer because when the fuel prices at the start of the pandemic came down to about less than 20 dollars a barrel it was countries like india who stood up for uh, the opec and said that you know we need some kind of rationalization because these producers are going to bear the brunt of it if not so do you see some kind of a rift coming through because the opec members are not, have they have decided not to uh, uh, not not to rationalize the rates now i i first of all i would like to say that i quite agree with uh, uh, dr duwa's analysis that uh, things uh, are more or less back to the 2019 uh, levels uh, in terms of oil the production has been kept low because uh, or lower than uh, in 2019 uh, somewhat because uh, people were not very sure what offtake there would be so that is there now the uh, current prices are uh, hovering around 82 83 dollars per barrel which is uh, very high if you consider that in 2020 and even in 2019 the rates were uh, much lower much lower than uh, 60 dollars uh, i'm talking of the normal year 2019 so uh, it is uh, uh, i think uh, exceptionally high for uh, the production capabilities that the opec countries have and uh, it is uh, uh, to be seen how they are able to withstand pressure especially from the european union and from uh, the us to keep uh, attack, uh, keep this uh, production on hold and not increase it so that the global prices come down so that is one issue the second issue is about Uh, and uh, in this context i must mention that the europeans are negotiating uh, uh, with the russians to have a special dispensation so that the russians give them oil and gas which uh, is required for the winter heating purposes uh, in uh, the whole of europe as far as the us is concerned of course it will not get uh, uh, that much affected by very high global prices uh it will uh, in fact be able to withstand the high prices and benefit from it because it will be exporting a lot of shale oil and gas uh, mostly shale oil now coming to india when the prices were low and we were facing the pandemic we were uh, spending the government was spending a lot of money so uh, Uh, it was a, a conscious decision on the part of the to the consuming public and to in fact keep the level of uh, the indian prices uh, much higher so that uh, the balance could be mopped up and utilized for 
revenue expenditure. Now the situation has come that uh, the prices have risen to more than 100 rupees per, for petrol uh, almost everywhere in India. And for diesel also, it has gone up. So what impact will it have on one, uh, inflation, and two, specifically on industrial production? Now, uh, ri uh, pr price rise in, uh, in uh, petrol and diesel have been shown to have a direct correlation. Of course, uh, inflation does not uh, go through the roof if uh, prices go up because we have been having prices in the region of, let's say, 95 rupees to 100 rupees for the past one year or so. So it is uh, not uh, uh, very unusual. There would be an inflationary impact. Prices would go up. Mm -hmm. And two, the raw materials uh, and the feedstock, et cetera, of the uh, industrial production, uh, required for industrial production, that will be dearer. So the prices of other products also will go up. All this will get reflected in the inflation index. Sure. Points taken. Let me take the points that you're making forward now with the TK Arun. You know, uh, there is no doubt that rise in fuel prices has a cascading effect and has an impact on everything else around us as well. And it is the common man that bears the brunt of it. How much of an impact do you see it having on economic growth? What kind of inflationary pressure are we going to see going forward, TK Arun? So we saw uh, consumer prices actually come down below 5% for the first time after several months in August. But the core uh, inflation, which is the overall price index minus food and fuel, was higher at 5.8%. So basically, this is uh, oil prices, which are, uh, while, while we are saved by low food prices, oil prices are still very sticky, and that is actually causing other prices also to uh, go up. But let me just go take one step backward to put the current uh, price rise of fuels in perspective. Uh, I would say this has a lot to do with climate change and the de-emphasis on hydrocarbons as a result of climate change. Globally, there is pressure on uh, economies, governments, uh, investors, everybody to go for uh, clean energy, renewable energy, and to de-emphasize coal and oil. As a result of that, from 2014 onwards, investment globally in hydrocarbons has been sharply down. In 2020, we even saw oil prices turn negative briefly. So all this is actually putting pressure on uh, oil companies to go slow on investment in these sectors. We saw a few months ago the uh, annual general meeting of Exxon Mobil elect three members to the board of that company against the wishes of the management to press for this oil company, which is quintessentially an oil company, to go in for renewable energy to mitigate the damage it is doing because of pumping out oil. So this is the kind of pressure in which global energy companies are right now operating. Now, same with, thing with coal. While the price of renewable energy is coming down around the world drastically, we are not actually factoring in the cost of integrating this renewable energy into the grid. When we look at the price of renewable energy and say, oh, it is so down to less than two rupees a unit now. When you buy power from intermittent sources, whether wind or solar, you have to keep your thermal power generation on the standby. Even if it's during the peak of the day, when you are able to fully draw lots of power from wind and solar, you have to have your thermal capacity available. It will not be operating, but it has to be available. This, there is a cost of availability. The cost of power is the cost of availability plus the cost of fuel. So you are paying for the price of uh, availability along with the cost of renewable power when you draw every single unit of renewable power into the grid. Plus, there is a cost of strengthening the grid and the cost of integrating the renewable, intermittent renewable power into the grid. So these are all costs which are borne by everybody. Now, we are transitioning to a low carbon economy, right? 
Now, in this period, the mainstay still remains coal and oil. So, if you decelerate investment in these sources, till we have progressed to some extent in the transition, uh, severe weather conditions of the kind we have seen in the last one year can deplete your uh, energy sources. Last winter was very severe in Europe and uh, across the Northern Hemisphere, which meant that a whole lot of gas that was stored during the pandemic induced slowdown got used up for heating during the winter. Subsequently, the summer was very intense. You have heat waves across the world, again, in many parts of the world. You saw temperatures reaching 48 degrees in Canada. Again, so a lot of energy had to be spent on cooling, on air conditioning. In addition, a drought in Brazil and other parts of Latin America dried up reservoirs. So they could not produce uh, hydroelectricity the way they used to in the past and instead turn to gas. So creating another demand on gas supplies. Now, all this has created, uh, put a strain on gas availability, right. uh, boosted by a couple of uh, outages in uh, LNG capacity in the US. Now, this is one part of the story. Now, why are we unable to produce enough coal? Uh, what prevents India, which has the fourth largest resource of coal in the world, from producing coal? This is the long-standing problem that we created this monopoly, state monopoly in coal, and then we gave captive mining rights to people who need the uh, coal uh, to produce coal so that it doesn't stay under the ground and we don't entirely depend on imports. Mm. Now, we have a very restrictive pricing regime when it comes to electricity. While our people are happily paying 100 rupees and 105 rupees per patrol, Indian politicians believe that if you ask people to pay for the power they consume, they will revolt. Right. So your price of power is kept artificially low because of which or most of our utilities are bankrupt. They don't have enough money to pay for their supply. So as Mr. Dua said, uh, we don't actually uh, keep enough uh, coal in reserve. And uh, there is a general crisis in coal availability. Sure. And the political games that we played with captive mines, when the Modi government came to power, they canceled all the captive mines saying they were all uh, corrupt. This actually delayed the uh, activation of many of these mines. And some of them still are not working even after they were auctioned off and some people have got those uh, licenses. Mm. So there is a reduction in captive mining of coal and coal India con continues to be inefficient. And the, in order to please the government, they increase their output. When they increase their output, what they actually did was to change the classification of completely non-combustible rock and shale. They classified as coal and started shipping it. So mm. your production went up but actually it didn't produce any additional energy. So the inefficiency of the state monopoly should have been done away with, and we should have initiated uh, you know, merchant mining long ago. That process is still underway. We still haven't been able to award uh, firm contracts and that has started producing. So these are all the um, sort of problems by, as a result of which we are witnessing a, a shortage. I sure. just want to add one thing. Yes. You know, the world is very generous when it comes to the United States. The US today is the world's largest producer of oil, if you take into account shale. Everybody is pointing fingers at, at, at OPEC and saying, you know, you because they are not uh, reducing output, they are keeping their prices uh, high by cutting on production. Why is the US not stepping up oil, shale oil production? They are also huge beneficiary when oil prices go up, all the oil companies in the US, but they are below the radar. They escape criticism. Shale is not producing the way they used to produce. Whereas above $60, shale is perfectly profitable. You can produce. Uh, US capital markets are still very efficient. Uh, Long-term interest rates are way below uh, 2% in the US. Mm. They can mobilize the capital, invest in shale, and start producing. You have an increased supply of gas and oil. That's not happening. Absolutely. And Russia has been trying to put pressure on Europe to clear the sanction for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which will bypass Ukraine and deliver gas to Germany directly. Now, there has been a lot of political opposition to this. And high gas prices, Russia believes, will, and actually the belief is true, will help tame the opposition to the Nord Stream 2, and they'll get the approval for that. And probably once that approval is given, they will increase supplies, and some of the price rise in gas in Europe will come down. Points taken. Points taken. Very interesting uh, 
points made by, by TK Arun and not mincing any words, calling a spade a spade. So, so Dua, let me take a couple of those points forward with you now. You know, this is a very interesting take on fossil fuels and how the world is transitioning into renewables and not much investment or not much thought is going into uh, improving the supply as well as capacity of fossil, fossil fuels because the companies themselves are not sure about what the future has in store. Frank, I, I must say I found uh, TK's analysis extremely exhilarating. But one thing which I would like to comment on was on his initial part, and that's what you were asking me about, that the transition is actually happening in the way it should happen, is what I got from TK's uh, analysis, that there is a reduction in fossil fuel consumption, and that actually the world is moving towards the renewables. I think, uh, that probably doesn't get borne out entirely by the little bit of data which we have of 2020. Full data of 2020 is not available because and 1920 is the one which we go by. Till 1920, the gas consumption in the rich world, uh, G20 plus a few other countries, had increased by 12%. And the coal consumption had increased globally by 5%. In China, India, Indonesia, the US, in that order, we are the consumers of coal. You know, China and India are gobbling away a major share, and China almost three times ours. The point I'm trying to make is, yes, the, we need to transit the way TK said, that you know have much more renewables, etc. But he also pointed out all the constraints to making renewables the mainstay of your transmission systems. Unless huge size storage batteries are fitted into the system, it cannot be the base. It cannot be meeting the base load. The base load has to remain the combustion the fossil fuel combustions because one technology we haven't developed for large storage batteries the we need not only we need large capacity of storage batteries but smaller size we need batteries which are lighter in weight and more less expensive than the lithium ion which are there today so it is going to for instance i just give you an example in india to make that 450 gigawatts, which has been announced as our target for 2030, and which the Prime Minister is likely to announce since the Prime Minister has conveyed his acceptance of the COP26 no, meeting at Glasgow, there, there is a lot of expectation in what he would say. It requires an investment in our transmission system starting now of $200 billion a year. First, where the, where the consumption point is, where the solar and the wind power will come from, those don't really always match. The, then you have to put in what's called a high voltage alternating current, HVAC, the, which are high voltage currents means, or H, HVDC, whichever, means hell of a lot of investment plus the storage batteries and then only you will be able to have operating 450 gigawatts of power otherwise you can create the capacity but it would not be generating that the order of power which is required so this this applies to globally as well i read just yesterday since i was writing something on climate change the investment required globally is over a trillion dollars to make this transition just in transmission. The, so that apart, the question does remain that today in India and many other parts of the world, the movement is not going to be straight jumping off 
to the renewables unless all these supporting mechanisms or supporting investment takes place it is going to be from dirty fuel the black and brown uh, coal to oil some parts of the world even oil and the in india we are aspiring to raise the share of and the prime minister himself declared go up from 6% to 15% right so it's not renewable because we you can still produce same type of power as you do from coal by using gas moving the turbines under pressure mm -hmm. all that kind of a thing so the the oh, the, the what i'm driving at is that the transition to renewables is going to be gradual unless some 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 from money comes in from somewhere and the technology improves far more we are laying just to complete my argument we are laying hell of a lot in store uh, uh, on hydrogen today if we use the hydro the normal way of producing hydrogen globally is electrolysis that means water split into hydrogen and oxygen oxygen we use somewhere else hydrogen we use either for fuel cells because fuel cells can carry much more hydrogen than our tanks etc or we put it in pipes and move it but the global capacity for electrolysis is 2000 and i'm i'm saying it responsibly 2000 megawatts and what is our consumption globally 200 times already what it will be 10 years later so you have to be moving you know reliance has tied up with one of these electrolysis makers is in denmark during the prime minister of denmark's visit there was an agreement signing or an mou signing with this company in denmark so we need to move away and it's very expensive today as mukesh ambani declared it in his agm when he talked about moving into hydrogen it costs Six dollars a kilogram to produce the hydrogen. Right. He did announce that he wants to bring it down to one dollar. Probably he might be able to do it, but if he produces this hydrogen on a global scale, hmm. and the technology which he gets into India or from outside becomes available to others, if it technology is going to remain confined to a handful of people. you would see monop the all the consequences of a monopoly being there and the transition wouldn't be there Absolutely. so apart from finances this technology transfer is an issue which is extremely important to really see the transition take place all this if you and i know frank in this discussion the investors in oil and gas know it even better absolutely they are not going to waste it so the when with 12% gas consumption increasing coal consumption increasing the and substitution of oil is by gas but the investment from one part of the hydrocarbon industry is taking place in another sure absolutely points taken Uh, Mr. Dasgupta, let me bring in another aspect and a perspective into the picture as well. You know, let's not forget at the end of the day, oil prices have reached record highs. They are scoring centuries in all cities across the country, and the common man is concerned about this because it's burning a hole in the common man's pocket. So, as far as options are concerned, you know, to try and offset the prices, what what are they? Well, um. in the short term i can't think of anything which will bring down the prices of oil because our import bill is uh, dependent on 83 dollars per barrel but in the long run we can do various things which discussed of course uh, one of the you know uh, for instance uh, rather than have five day attendance you can have three day attendance but in the manufacturing industry it may be difficult in the services industry for instance uh, especially people who are working from home it uh, does have a lot of fuel but now with the pandemic uh, on the wane at least in india uh, there are many very large uh, companies which uh, employ lakhs of people 
uh, who are thinking of uh, retaining some people at uh, the work from home level and uh, asking the others to come to office, but not on a regular basis, not for five days a week, perhaps for two, three days a week. So that could also lead to some uh, conservation of uh, our uh, fuel bill, our, our resources and uh, reduction in our fuel bill. But that remains to be seen. But the ma major part of uh, uh, our transportation is dependent, whether it is our diesel locomotives, which um, haul uh, um, you know, goods across the country, or the trucks, which drive the economy. But they are dependent on diesel. So personal transportation can be reduced a little bit, but transportation of goods, I think uh, it will be very difficult to uh, really make a dent. The last point is that we have been trying to, for the past uh, many years, trying to develop our inland waterways. And that is uh, one way of nation. So that is the third thing. The last point which I wanted to mention in the context of what Mr. Dr. Dua said, it is absolutely correct that uh, at the moment, uh, um, hydrogen, I think the whole economy is taking baby steps. But there are very uh, interesting developments which are taking place, including green hydrogen. Um, in fact, uh, some pilot plants are being set up even in India. One has been, uh, is almost uh, uh, through uh, in Oman and in various parts of the world. So hydrogen will perhaps, if the costs can be brought down, and very importantly, you know, in the climate change talks, a hundred billion dollars worth of funds were to be created for the transfer of technology for developing countries. Now, unfortunately, most of the donor countries, the large donors, they uh, did not quite uh, uh, contribute to building up that $100 billion fund. And it was uh, very disappointing. So unless the world as a whole takes this uh, very seriously, and there is this, uh, um, this uh, emphasis on cooperation, because it is a global problem. If there is no transfer of technology, the poorer countries will keep on burning fuel, uh, fossil fuel and uh, adding to the, the, um, uh, the carbon uh, footprint in the globe. So, so that is extremely important. So the next climate change talks, I think, apart from focusing on when does you know, the emissions of a country peak and when does it become carbon neutral? In fact, I think China has taken a very bold step that it is sticking to its uh, commitment that by 2030, it will uh, have peak emissions. And by 2050 or 2060, it will be carbon neutral. So it will then be dependent on um, solar, wind, hydel, and perhaps uh, hydrogen or some substitute. But it will give up its dependent the extent of about 65, 66% on coal for sure. its uh, energy production. So that is uh, with China's resources, with its uh, uh, drive towards developing new technologies, we are sure that it will be able to show and, uh, and uh, take its share of the of responsibility in this development. Points taken. Uh, uh, TK Arun, coming back to you now, you know, let's look at the consumption really as far as uh, uh, fuels in India is concerned. You know, if you look at the September data, uh, petrol consumption has gone up by almost 10% compared to the same time last year. And uh, diesel has not gone up as much. It is only about 6% uh, for the same time uh, as last year. Uh, and if you look at diesel, it is used heavily in industries and agriculture. So does this tell us a story as well? I think the traditional story is the deduced from consumption of diesel might be changed from the fact that we have now laid power lines to practically all villages. And you can actually supply grid power during off-peak hours for agriculture purposes, and they don't really need to use diesel pumps. This needs to be factored in while we analyze this data. 
so economic activity is picking up so uh, and is picking up robustly so i think we will see larger consumption of petrol and diesel but uh, one way to bring down prices is to reduce some of the taxes we live the bulk of the price of petrol and diesel at the uh, petrol pump today comes from taxes levied by the center and by the state governments so both can actually agree to pay some of these taxes and pass it on to the consumer otherwise you will see just the fuel price causing the rbi to refuse to or rather to raise rates and uh, instead of lowering them and you'll curtail growth and so the entire effort of trying to pop the economy by spending money generated by taxing fuel might be defeated so that is one option that is uh, available i would just like to say some things about uh, you know the intermittent uh, power supply uh, yes hydrogen is one way of storing power you can have pump storage you can pump water up to, up to an uh, altitude and then run it down to turn a turbine that is the most traditional conventional way of uh, storing uh, power generated during peak hours of solar and wind activity the increasingly popular one is to generate uh, green hydrogen you use solar energy to produce hydrogen and you ship that hydrogen and where required you generate uh, uh, power using hydrogen you can burn that fuel it's a combustible material so just like you burn petrol and diesel you can burn it you know, and uh, generate enough heat to uh, produce steam and run turbine or it can be used in uh, vehicles you can fill the fuel tank with hydrogen and hydrogen is supplied to uh fuel cells and the fuel cell will generate electricity and it will drive an electric motor so there are various ways of using that i think we need to look at some technological solutions also one of the largest ways that oil companies produce hydrogen today and they require that to clean up uh, the sulfur from the oil they produce is by reforming uh, natural gas gas uh, reformation as it is called is how you produce uh, hydrogen now we have so much of coal that coal should be gasified and the gasified uh, sorry the gasified uh, gas that comes out should be reformed to produce hydrogen now if you can use energy from uh, solar or wind to do this then the uh, gas that comes out the hydrogen that comes out will be green hydrogen that is it is virtually not using any of the existing carbon now i think india is taking a very major lead in essentially through private uh, investment ambani has promised 10 billion dollar investment the adani has promised 20 billion dollars worth of investment and with the aim of producing hydrogen at 1 rupee a kilo the infrastructure bill that biden is trying to push through congress it envisages paying 6 dollars a kilo subsidy for producing hydrogen so i think we will be without any subsidy producing much cheaper hydrogen by the end of the decade than uh, most countries of the world and i think one shouldn't forget the nuclear power we have this fast build program to make use of the thorium reserves available in kerala the through the ilmenai sand and these should be utilized we have a prototype of a fast build uh, reactor which can produce electricity as well as fuel which can be self sustaining and i think we should scale up our atomic uh, power generation and that is absolutely clean it doesn't produce any uh, carbon emission it doesn't produce any uh, major transportation issue of storage or anything and we are neglecting this particular option uh, i don't know why we are doing that Absolutely. the world at large will we will need to actually move uh, shifted to will uh, shift to larger and larger lands on nuclear power and i i think the prospects are quite bright including for fusion energy sure all right uh, time to get quick closing comments with the with the best way forward from all my panelists starting first with you mr duwa i think we remain despite all the difficulties we need we need to remain optimistic that some some technology would come become commercially available to uh, facilitate transition maybe storage batteries maybe hydrogen or it could be something altogether which is still at the research lab a uh, research at the research level i am not giving up on it but all that i'm saying is that cop 26 like its all its predecessors will have to remain cognizant that all this is going to require fair amount of international cooperation 
largely as pointed out by my distinguished panelists, is technology transfer and finances. And it might be useful to set ambitious targets rather than taking conservative ones, because the moment you take conservative targets, all we will start forgetting about climate change and the importance which it deserves. Whereas what we have seen in the last two years in particular, and this year with heat waves in the US, Canada, Brazil, uh, all kinds of places, as well as in India, uh, the floods, hurricanes, that what is required is urgent action rather than postponing it. So accepting and more ambitious targets of carbon neutrality, stopping or uh, seizing altogether coal, coal burning by 2030 for some nations, by 2040 for another set, 2050 for probably the least developed countries, mm -hmm. is some graded sort of a way forward. And that can come about only if we remain optimist, even if it's not getting substantiated by past, that the future would be greener and it would try to. Absolutely. Mr. Das Gupta. Um, uh, in brief, I think uh, this present uh, shortage of fuel or the high prices, uh, they are uh, not going to last for very long. I think uh, we may see it uh, run its course over the next six to eight months and things uh, may get back to normal. Uh, that is to about the 2019 levels, not the 2020 levels. So that is one thing, but, but this is a warning bell. And this is something which the rest of the world needs to wake up to. And uh, in uh, the COP26, very serious consideration has to be given to technology transfer, to building, building up a corpus and to thinking of ways of solutions of tackling it on a global scale with the international cooperation, with uh, all uh, uh, countries pooling their resources together, technological, uh, financial, human resource, everything together. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. Dikya, don't close the show for us with your concluding remarks. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Uh, Dasputa on uh, the likelihood of the shortage being very temporary. I mean, if the US were to conclude a deal with Iran and revive the uh, Iran nuclear deal, you could see Iranian uh, output of oil and gas coming into play. Uh, if OPEC can be persuaded to, and similarly, the US also agrees to increase production, you can see additional uh, output coming in. Russia will probably start supplying more gas as soon as the Nord Stream, uh, Nord Stream 2 is approved. I would like to say just two, uh, two things. One, India needs to make our power prices flexible. All energy prices must be flexible. This is the only way we can uh, create easy substitution of fuels. If one fuel is, uh, becomes more expensive, then it can be substituted with another, only if there is flexibility. So this might see some prices go up. Then the solution is to protect the vulnerable people by transferring subsidy to them, not by keeping prices down. If you keep prices artificially repressed, the adjustments that are required to create efficient increase in production and reduction in demand will not take place. That is one thing. Second thing is, as I said, you need to increase your uh, nuclear uh, option open and keep that, keep that uh, going up uh, even further. And the third thing is to increase your R&D on making clean use of the coal that you are plentifully uh, endowed with. We can't afford the biggest primary source of energy that has been given to us in, by nature in our country. The point is to find technology that will allow us to make clean use of this without adding to pollution. Such technologies exist or need to be invented, and I'm sure that can be done. And I think we should not uh, give up on this uh, effort. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen, we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Well, what's coming out of this discussion is that climate change is real and things can only get worse from here. We are witnessing unusual weather activity. What we need is better planning and seriousness to deal with the situation at hand. 
what we are witnessing is years of neglect uh, to the environment and we have to take action right now. We need strong efforts at the local, national and global level. Our inability to assess risk always comes to the fore when nature's fury strikes. We are reactive, not just in India, but around the world. We have to be proactive. What we do, we should uh, be better, like building the right kind of uh, uh, buildings depending on the region and topography. Map, plan and adapt, that is the mantra. Well, before I go, let me once again uh, remind you to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and share the content as well so that more people get to know about us. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive information. If you like our content, please contribute to keep it alive. A small contribution uh, that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. Let me also inform you that we have some massive discounts at the Bharata First Knowledge Center and we will be closing registrations for the existing packages soon. This is your last chance to get these offerings. I will be taking live big picture current affairs classes starting very soon. And uh, this will give you a chance to interact with me on a live basis. So don't miss out on that. Go to kc.bharatavas.com and register right now. Hundreds are reaping the benefits of the Knowledge Center. Don't be left behind. All this information along with some must-see recommendations are in the description of this video. Please go through it. That's it for me. See you again next time.